This week on Arizona Illustrated, Sarah Sellers, ahead of the pack. Suffering is sometimes what leads to the greatest highs in running. The only time I really feel that runner's high is when I'm running super hard. Rollies in Tucson. People didn't see my vision here until I opened up. People are, you got a donkey. Nothing's making sense. I'll go, just wait till I open and you'll see. And the day I open, everybody's, oh, now we see. Now we know that you're not crazy. June West sings, do me right. The lowland leopard frog. Like most amphibians, they're very sensitive to environmental change. And for the National Park Service, this is what we do. Our job is to protect these native species. And from the vault. This is a plan to construct an invisible wall around the Catalina Foothills School District. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. 27-year-old Tucson-based nurse and distance runner Sarah Sellers trains every day. But unlike many runners who dominate the big races, she had only run one marathon when she entered the best-known race in the country, one that was marked by freezing temperatures and driving rain. Getting there was one thing. Finishing was a different story. Suffering is sometimes what leads to the greatest highs in running. Sometimes when you're out there just hammering and pushing yourself, and in the middle of that, you'll kind of just get these chills and you just like feel really good. It's only when you're kind of making yourself suffer that you get that high. I'm Sarah Sellers. I'm a professional runner and full-time nurse anesthetist here in Tucson. I'm from Ogden, Utah. I grew up on the Wasatch Front. So beautiful trails, beautiful mountains in my backyard. And I started running pretty early and my parents going on the trails behind our house in the mornings. So I just started joining them on the trail runs and <laughs> I'm sure I slowed them down, but they were always super supportive. I just fell in love with running, with being on the trails. Kind of started competing in middle school and high school. I definitely wasn't the fastest runner on the team, but by my senior year of high school, I'd won a few state championships, and it wasn't really this realization like, oh, I have all this natural talent. It was just like, I knew that I loved the process of running, I loved being outside, and then the work that I put in really paid off. My first marathon was Huntsville, Utah, and that was last fall. I hadn't done any marathon-specific training for it. It was actually held on the last day that you could qualify for Boston. And I won the marathon for women's division, and I've never been so sore in my life. <laughs> I couldn't run for like two weeks after, but it kind of gave me a glimpse that I thought if I could put in a good block of training, that a marathon could be something that I thought I could succeed at. I'm running 90 to 100 miles a week. The vast majority of my miles are on the roads or on the Tucson Loop Path. I would rather run the cold <laughs> any day, but I think running in the heat has been beneficial for me. Being an elite distance runner does require a lot of sacrifices. You're either injured or almost injured. I had several stress fractures. One stress fracture that ended my collegiate career. It could have potentially never healed. There was one run, a 14 mile run. I started off in shorts and it started raining. I tripped, really scraped my knee hard and pretty hypothermic. I had no nutrition. My like, sleep turned to snow. And I remember my legs hurt so bad. That was probably the coldest I've ever been. But it taught me that I could do hard things. The morning of the Boston Marathon, there was snow on the ground, yet it was raining. I think I was wearing like five layers on top and bottom because I didn't want to waste energy shivering. My number one goal was a time goal. I wanted to run faster than 237. And in those conditions, I knew that would likely be impossible. Once the gun went off, the conditions are just crazy and just 
You feel like you're in a car wash. The wind, I think, was 20, 25 miles an hour and direct headwind the whole way. But I just tucked right in, kind of to the back of this group of elite women. And after about a mile or two, the lead group broke off and we started breaking into smaller groups. And now things are blowing sideways. Now, along with the rain, you can see the temperature is minus one Celsius. And somewhere after halfway, another of the elite women passed me and I went with her. She was running a pace that I didn't think I could keep. I was pretty tired at that point. I didn't know how I'd feel the last three miles of the marathon, but I thought like, I'm just gonna stick with her. So I stuck with her for about eight miles and then with about three miles to go, um, just went for it. I was kind of delirious at that point. Don't remember a lot of the details, but then with the home stretch, I felt like I was just in a screaming tunnel of people. I remember thinking like, Everyone's super excited, I must be doing really well. But then the first place of the men's division passed me with about 150 meters to go. And I thought, like, they're cheering for him, they're not cheering for me. And here is Sarah Sellers of the United States. I thought like I'm somewhere in the mid pack of women. And then I crossed the finish line and I asked the race volunteers, what place am I, what place am I? And one of them said I was second, and like I just had to have her keep repeating it because I thought there's no way I was second. <laughs> that's not possible, like that doesn't happen. And my next thought was I need to go find someone that I know and verify that this is real life <laughs> and that that actually happened. And my husband actually was jumping up and down and like, yelling, you're stuck in a freaking Boston Marathon. <laughs> That's, I think, when it hit me that it was real. On that day, the opportunity that presented itself was very different. Second place wasn't gonna go to someone who could run in good conditions. It was gonna go to me, who didn't necessarily have the right credentials to get second, but my body held up under the elements. It's given me a lot of faith in myself because there's definitely runs more often than I'd like to admit where you don't feel like running. You don't feel good. But just getting out there and doing it is a success. I'm awake, I'm away, I'm a dreamin'. I'm awake, I'm away, I'm a dreamin'. I'm awake, I'm awake, am I dreaming? Sarah Sellers will be taking her talents to the streets of the Big Apple in November when she runs in the New York City Marathon. She's also training to earn a spot on the U.S. track and field team with hopes to compete at the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, Japan. Tucson, the world city of gastronomy, is home to some of the best Mexican food in America. Some would say the best. Now there's another South Side player on the scene, Rollies. Chef Mateo Otero carries on his family's culinary traditions with his own twist. Last May, I was looking for a building like Northwest Side, Marana. And it wasn't happening, so I called a real estate buddy of mine. Two days later, he, he found me a kitchen, pulled up. I wasn't too impressed by the building right away, but as soon as I walked in the doors of the patio, I was like, hey, cool, I can make a patio concept. He 
People didn't see my vision here until I opened up. People are, you got a donkey. Nothing's making sense. I'll go, just wait till I open and you'll see. And the day I open, everybody's, oh, now we see. Now we know that you're not crazy. Because everyone knows I am crazy. So our specialty over here is our roll tacos. That's where the name Rollies came from, for roll tacos. You get them in chicken, beef, or cauliflower. You can get it with the queso sauce or rojo sauce. So our drowning flautas here. With the cheese sauce, it's topped with green chili, cotija cheese, green onion, and sour cream. And this is a Rollies beef queso right here. Literally got this restaurant open in three weeks. I didn't think it was gonna pick up as fast as it did. As soon as we opened the doors, it was been full speed. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. I was born and raised here. I actually went to school right down the street, right here in Twelfth and Ajo, a Catholic school, St. John's. When my grandparents moved from Mexico, they moved from Hermosillo, Sonora. The first house my tata bought was right here on Twelfth and Ohio. This is exactly where the restaurant's at. So I feel like it was meant to be right here. What number are you on? Um, 18. These are ground beef patty tacos. We call them Nana's tacos here. And this is a Tuesday special we do here every Tuesday. Basically, it's a ground beef, a little oregano, salt and garlic, cotija cheese, and peas. This is it right here. These ones are missing the peas. They said no peas. If you're from Tucson, you were raised on these. If you came from, uh, you know, a Chicano family. I was in a program, it was called Instant Program for a high school kid. So at 14, I was getting a paycheck already, cooking at different restaurants in the studio union. And then I started busting studs at a Tucson Mall back in the days called Louis, oh no, Luby's. It was a, like a cafeteria, like a first cafeteria type deal inside the mall. And I was the big time pot washer there. When I got out of culinary school, I started a catering business. So I started catering, I did it 13 years. People would say, hey, you need to open up your own business already. And I, you know, knowing it's a hard business, I really didn't want to. I didn't want to do the whole food truck thing. So I thought this was perfect. This was like in between a food truck and a restaurant. It's like right in the middle. We have a specials on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And today's special is a carne asada baker wrap torta. which has caramelized onions, roasted green chili, it's molded with a mozzarella cheese, and then it's stuffed in a baker wrap torta, then finished with sliced avocado and our signature rolly sauce. I feel like I thought outside the box, but not way outside the box. These are old, old Sonoran Tucson recipes, Chicano food, you would call it, Mexican-American food with a modern twist to it but I still keep my sauces and everything really authentic, but I just throw a little twist. I'm gonna say it's Sonoran new style Tucson food. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this episode and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about our work and what's happening in our community. And now, do me right a song from June West. Won't you give me a little time and attention, time and attention, whoa. Don't you want to be the nation blind?
stuck in my mind like a first kiss of bliss without the lips. Connections filling radio waves all over the road. If I could touch you again, I would live a thousand years of Oh, give it to me, I'll give it to you. Worth it to me, I'll make it worth it for you. It's a magical ride, magical ride Matching each stride Going side by side These waves are breaking me down I was riding the clouds Now my feet are rooted to the ground Trying to get back to the house on the mountain where quality love flows free and easy from a Scientists are concerned about the long-term status of the lowland leopard frog in Arizona due to declining habitats and the invasive American bullfrog. Arizona Game and Fish, under the State Wildlife Action Plan, considers this species of greatest conservation concern. In spring 2016, we went to find out more. The little lowland leopard frog is facing some sizable challenges in its historic range. It has already disappeared from large sections of California, New Mexico, and Arizona, where it used to live in habitats such as rivers, small streams, and ponds. The remaining populations face various threats. Many of their habitats have dried up due to water use by humans. Their water gets dirty from runoff after major fires, or they are killed by a deadly fungal skin disease that affects amphibians. In many ways, the frog is emblematic of the larger environmental issues in our region. It may just be a frog, but that frog's still important, and um, it's going to affect other things that you might not be aware of. Not only are the frogs suffering, but when they're suffering, the whole ecosystem is suffering. Emily Huddleston moved to Tucson from the Phoenix metropolitan area to study journalism at the University of Arizona. So we talked last time about being she was intrigued by the local habitats and conservation community in Pima County, and soon she decided to add environmental studies to her courses. There's just so much to do and drive 10 minutes and you're in the middle of nowhere, and I really think that's kind of what sparked my interest. While working as an intern for Sarawa National Park, she heard about a cooperative effort in the historic Notch neighborhood to help the lowland leopard frog. So I've written about this um, in a report that I'm working on for Swar National Parks, and I also wrote a more extended article for my science journalism class here at U of A. In the Notch neighborhood just west of the park, Huddleston discovered residents such as Karen Reifschneider are caring for artificial ponds that can serve as a little refuge for the frog, a backup population in case of an emergency. The ponds augment the nearby natural tinajas, small bodies of water that form in our region's mountainous bedrock. However, the Tinaja's future, and that of the frogs, is uncertain. 
And we talked about what might happen if something happened to those Tinajas, if uh, a, a dramatic fire, uh, an extended drought, those Tinajas went dry, they would probably all die. The species would die out because they need water, they need to be wet. They aren't like toads where they can go under the ground. They need to be wet all the time. So far, Reif Schneider, scientists, and other concerned residents have built a total of seven ponds in the community. Things were falling into place, and then a surprise. In this rough, dry desert most of the year, a tough, introduced competitor searches for water. I did not expect to get traveling bullfrogs because there's no water course for at least a mile and a half from here. The American bullfrog is a powerful eating machine. It consumes many other critters, including the lowland leopard frog, which is easy prey for the ravenous invader. My first bullfrog appeared in my pond two years after we established it on a day in June, which was at the end of a week of 100 plus days, and it was 106 degrees out here that day. He managed to take a hike and hike to my pond. So Reifschneider built barriers to keep the bullfrogs out and those efforts are being replicated elsewhere. This pond is located at the Desert Research Learning Center, which is next to Saguaro National Park. Bullfrogs can climb fences, so a smooth top is necessary to counter their acrobatic abilities. We're getting temperature, pH. This allows scientists to promote their research and conservation in a man-made Tinaja setting without the aggressive invasive. The water is a big hit for local birds. They can fly in and out, and there's hope this mini ecosystem will also help the little lowland leopard frog. Like most amphibians, they're very sensitive to air pollution, water pollution, environmental change. Um, and for the National Park Service, this is what we do. Our job is to protect these native species. And raising awareness is part of that formula. I think the science journalism class was a really great experience because it was perfect. It combined my love for the environment with writing, which is something I'm striving to currently do. You know, we, we really need to kind of help us communicate the science. You know, a lot of this stuff is, is sort of really interesting to a scientist or someone like me, um, but maybe doesn't translate well to the average person. And so uh, Emily's helping us kind of do that. The lowland leopard frog still has no official status under the Endangered Species Act, but remains a conservation concern. Emily Huddleston graduated from the U of A and now works in public relations for Canyon Ranch in Tucson. The multiple votes on funding the construction of Catalina Foothills High School were contentious. The school board and parents grappled to find a solution and students were caught in the middle. Here's a look back at 1988 from the vault. Voters have consistently said no to the idea of a high school in the Catalina Foothills School District. Now students are bused to one of six high schools in other districts. Paul Julian is the only member of the five-member Catalina Foothills School Board who opposes the new high school. This is a concept that truly is a plan to construct an invisible wall around the Catalina Foothills School District. Superintendent Bob Hetzel supports the idea of a high school for the district and he says the issue will be put before voters again. And what we have to help people see is that it's an asset to this community, that it truly is going to be a community high school, not just for kids but for everybody. The high school is a volatile issue in the Catalina Foothills School District. Many feel it has polarized the community. Judy Botwin is president of the Orange Grove Family Faculty Association. Very divisive. I think less divisive this time than the last time we had a bond election, but still I think that there's a lot of anger and a lot of people not talking to each other, and that's too bad. I was told that coming out of the polling places yesterday, whether they were for or against the high school, everyone was angry. They're angry because it isn't passing, and they're angry because they have to keep voting again. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's split the district.
Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, concussions. What's being done? It's the impact of a car accident that these professional and, and collegiate football players are encountering. So on a daily basis, they're going through car accident after car accident after car accident, and those are the impacts that can cause concussion. And being there for mothers. Regardless of socioeconomic status or age, the challenge of the mom is you're always split. And it's hard to function as a split person. You have to be whole. And it's hard to have a new baby, regardless of how old you are, whether it's your fourth baby or your first baby, it's hard each time. And here's a sneak peek at a story we're working on, A Mountain Memories. My dad used to bring our whole cross country team up here. He'd drop us off at the bottom and then we'd have to run up. And then this was kind of like our gift at the end, you know, kind of just watch the view. It's so beautiful up here though, peaceful. We were driving and she's like, look at mommy, mommy, the A, there's a big giant A. It is this big. <laughs> this big. Pretty big. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Look at this. I brought my son up here right after school so we can have some fun. Y you know what, right now, um, I could say I'm with him right now. This is, I'm building a great memory. I like the sunset and all the buildings and the lights. Um, <laughs> it's just really nice to look at. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.